everyone. Uh, we're happy to have you all here. Welcome to our webinar. My name is Daria, and together with Chris, we'll be your hosts for this event called Building Language Technologies for Our Underrepresented Languages. Language technologies are deeply integrated into our lives. We use them everywhere. Speech assistants like Google Home and Siri, machine translation services like Google Translate, and so on. However, not all languages get enough attention and are represented in such services. This webinar intends to discuss building language technologies for underrepresented languages and cultures. Uh, and today we are excited to have Sebastian and Felix joining us as our panelists. Um, they both have uh, extensive ex experience and knowledge in the field of NLP and language technologies. And we are eager to hear their insights and perspectives. Uh, let's get to know them better. Chris? Thank you very much, um, Daria. So um, I would like to explain the structure of this introduction. So I will introduce our speakers one by one. And when I introduce them, they will take the stage. I will write and explain an introduction about them. Then they will take the stage and then talk about um, anything they want to talk about relating to the work they're doing or, um, or any anything. So I will first introduce our first speaker and let's get started. So our first speaker is Sebastian Ruder. Um, Sebastian is a senior research scientist at Google, based in Berlin, Germany, working on natural language processing for underrepresented languages. Before that, he was a research scientist at DeepMind. He completed his PhD in natural language processing and deep learning at the Insight Research Center for Data Analytics while working as a research scientist at a Wylin, a Dublin-based startup. During his studies, he worked with Microsoft, IBM's Extreme Blue, Google Summer of Code, and SAP, among others. He's interested, and I might add, a very great expert in transfer learning for natural language processing, which is about languages and how to make computers understand humans and languages more. And he works greatly in making machine learning and natural language processing more accessible to everyone in everywhere. Thank you so much, Sebastian. And you can, I'll stop sharing so you can take the stage and share your screen. Um, sure, okay. Um, thanks so much for the very nice introduction, Chris, and uh, yeah, for the presentation, Daria. We can see your screen, but you're muted. Yeah, yep. I can hear you now. Awesome, cool. Um, all right, yeah, so I'm just going to use those 10 minutes just to give a brief overview of what I think are some uh, challenges and opportunities in this area of multilingual NLP, and particularly for languages that are currently underrepresented in research and, and in our uh, language technology. Um, and, um, and we can kind of talk more in depth about um, some the other challenges later on. <laughs> Um, and so the main challenges for me in this area personally um, are uh, related to mostly kind of constraints. So basically um, the lack of data for many languages, the um, lack of compute, because in many environments we would actually like to deploy these technologies, um, typically as users or um, research groups and even in industry, we might have less computational resources available. And finally, language uh, typology. So many of the languages we actually want to uh, want to target or that are currently underrepresented are um, linguistically different um, and different in terms of um, their morphology and their linguistic characteristics, uh, characteristics from the languages on which our models currently trained. And um, so to deal with these challenges, I think here are three um, kind of broad research directions. And in all cases, I'm basically just going to highlight like one example, um, which is as one way to make progress in these areas. 
And in particular for the, the first aspect here, um, I believe in order to kind of overcome this um, lack of data, one avenue is to look for alternative data sources. Um, so other ways um, where data might be available or might be easier to obtain. Um, because for most of the world's languages, um, text data that is available online is quite limited. Um, so we have to look for other resources in order to train and develop language technology for these models. And to give one example and kind of a brief overview of this distribution of data, um, you can see here on the right in the pie chart um, that about um, current models like multilingual birds, um, which is kind of a sta um, standard multilingual model these days, are trained or are covering about 1% of the world's languages. Um, if you go kind of to uh, beyond that, um, standard resources like Wikipedia or data on the web covers around 4% of the world's languages. And then kind of further beyond the Bible covers only about a quarter of the world's languages. And finally, there are other resources like building lexicons, for instance. So these are kind of lists of words and their translations across different languages, which cover kind of a wider set of data, uh, which is currently not being used. Um, and here, um, there's, for instance, um, in a recent um, paper, we, for instance, used um, these building lexicons to generate additional data for training these models. Um, and this just meant to give a small glimpse of uh, like potential alternative resources. And I think um, there's a lot of untapped potential in terms of using multimodal data, for instance, or um, other types of uh, data like um, radio, um, radio broadcasts, um, video speech uh, videos online, or even unwritten books that could be used to um, improve our language technology for these underrepresented languages. Um, Secondly, for on the compute aspect, I want to highlight in particular focusing on um, more efficient methods for um, developing uh, to be able to just do more with fewer parameters and more efficiently for these languages. Um, and here, I think one particular interesting paradigm is uh, focusing on learning um, modular representations. And one particular kind of um, instance of this methodology that I've worked on in the past. Uh, uses adapters, which are essentially small bottleneck layers that are inserted into the existing parameters of, an, of a multilingual model. And these um, parameters can then uh, learn uh, transformations that are um, language specific um, using kind of standard pre training tasks and thus allow the underlying model to specialize uh, to a particular language or to a particular task. And I think ultimately these types of um, sort of adapters, for instance, but other methods in this area allow us to take an existing model that may cover like a number of languages, but might not perform um, as well um, in our target language as we'd like. And using very small number of additional parameters, we can now specialize this model to the new language we actually care about. And I think this is kind of a, um, at least a, a viable strategy in which we can use models that already cover many languages and try to make them useful in a broader set of languages using what we already have in terms of the parameters and the information that these models have learned. Um, and finally, um, kind of in order to overcome these differences in language topology and in linguistic features um, that are that the languages um, that we have in NLP cover, um, uh, I think one kind of useful lesson here in context, or one uh, kind of useful context here, is uh, something that was said by Rich Sutton, which you might be aware of if you have been just generally following um, the trends in machine learning. And so Rich Sutton, who is a very, very famous researcher in reinforcement learning, for instance, um, has basically said that um, kind of the most important algorithmic advances that really stand the test of time are related to um, two things that uh, so two methods that can scale basically with increased computation arbitrarily. And these are, um, you said, search and learning. And um, so in practice, this has kind of led a lot of people to reflect on and basically just, um, it's kind of one argument why a lot of models these days are just scaled up arbitrarily um, as like one key um, way to improve um, model performance. Um, but I think for underrepresented languages and in particular African languages, this trend is not exactly the same um, because for many of the languages we talk about, actually computation and data are limited in fact. 
Um, so these moments, I think it's kind of actually important to rethink this bitter lesson and to think about instead, how can we use the data that we have most efficiently by incorporating some inductive bias or some knowledge of the language into our models. And one way um, that we can do that, for instance, is in terms of improving the uh, segmentation methods of our models. And past work, for instance, has observed that if you um, Heat uh, different words in different languages into a model. Um, these the current methods um, create and don't use the words directly as input, but we use subwords that are learned based on a large collection of data. Um, but these subwords, the way they are segmented, um, looks very different across different languages. So for uh, a language like English, which a model has seen a lot of during training, um, a lot of words just get a single subword. Um, but other languages, even other ones with relatively large amounts of data, are split into much smaller chunks. And if you go, if you look to the very long tail of languages, you now get subwords that consist of individual characters, even, which are much less useful for actually learning useful information about those languages. So actually trying to improve um, this support segmentation can be quite uh, beneficial for actually um, also learning um, better information, better representations for those underrepresented languages. Um, cool. So yeah, I think with that, um, I hope I was able to give kind of a, just a highlight a couple of directions that I think are interesting here. And I'm happy to dig deeper into any of these or just generally about other things um, in the rest of the session. Thank you very much, Sebastian. That's wonderful. Thank you so, so much. Um, let me have this ready. Okay, and with this, I will go on to introduce our next speaker. Um, so, if you want to, to build a um, maybe a translation model, um, so translate from one language to another, um, and then you want to use, I want to go to a website and use it, you'd probably go to some big tech companies' translation websites. So in Germany, you go to DeepL or Google Translate, but what if that language does not have your native language? It's a very low resource language. Um, so we have some African languages there, Indian languages, and they're um, very, very low resource languages that are not supported. There is one platform that can, with a high likelihood, support whatever tool you want to build, and that's Neurospace. Felix Sloman is the CEO of Neurospace. Um, Neurospace is a software as a service platform and also a no code platform which offers developers and end users a suite of APIs for different natural language processing tasks. So machine translation, summarization, um, and uh, you name it. And you can use it without having any machine learning or any data science knowledge. Their primary goal is to democratize NLP and make sure that any developer or any end user can create your app or build your, your application or your package and use advanced language processing, even for low resource languages and beyond English. So thank you so much. Um, and Felix, let's, let me unmute you and um, stop sharing and feel free to. Yeah, Chris, thank you very much for the intro. Um, it's a pleasure that I can be here and I will explain you today uh, what Neurospace does on the speech AI front. So let me quickly share my screen. Um, as Chris said, we work on multiple things as for example, machine translation, summarization, uh, entity recognition, instant classification, many more. Uh, but we also work on speech. So we have um, our internal developed uh, speech to text that is focusing on uh, anything that is code mixed specifically, what means we have more than one language that's very common in India, for example, but also in the Arabic speaking world, also in African countries where they mix the local language with English. Um, so what I will talk today about are uh, two things, the natural language generation, which is a text to speech or um, um, and synthetic voice creation and also speech to text. And I, for speech to text, I go into these code mix examples. So Hinglish is a mix of Hindi and English, and Banglish is a mix of Bengali and English. But you can really adapt that kind of technology to any other um, speech to text task that requires to understand more than one language. So uh, what we have really seen so far 
in at least in our experience in terms of what kind of interest we get from companies is that we have a machine translation very much google translate like maybe api based where you can directly translate documents or text we have local language chatbots which are over most of the time working on one language but as soon as you do something code mixed it normally breaks down we have some transliteration sentiment analysis and so on even some ocr which is not strictly nlp uh, but it's very often combined with an nlp task and we have seen a lot of more monolingual speech to text um, what we believe in Neurospace, really the future is where we have more of a video to video translation. So we combine actually multiple of the core NLP tasks, which are often called downstream tasks. We combine them um, to really serve an end to end use case. So in the video to video translation, what we have been working on, we are essentially using uh, three components. We do a speech to text. So from the audio, we do a transcription and text then we do the machine translation from text to text and then on the other end we do a text to speech and obviously everything behind everything happens kind of behind the scenes so for for the end customer it is a video to video translation tool we've also worked on hyper realistic voice generation with the text to speech and then this particularly a mixed language or code mix speech to text where you have for example arabic and english or we have also worked on Swahili and English in the past, or Hindi and English. Um, all the artificial speech generation, then again, OCR, where we have worked on multilingual OCR. So we really, we call it more building for the future because we want to combine multiple of our core services and of the commonly known NLP core services or downstream tasks into end-to-end -end, uh, products that take care of the entire uh, process. I would start with video localization. I have a couple of videos included um, in, in this presentation, and we will just go through them uh, one by one. And really, it's just for you to get to know uh, how what we have been working on and to see our platforms a little bit that we have been built. Uh, the video localization, we have been applying it so far for news, uh, for podcast education documentaries, where, for example, translated some educational contact that was recorded in Hindi about physics, um, we have done it in Malayalam and Telugu and other Indian languages, um, just so we have um, the, the the lecture can actually reach more people. There was an example in India, but yeah, applicable to many, many more cases. Yeah, so let's start with the video. Um, I hope the audio... We live in an era where millions of people are consuming video news content in local languages online. Video creators are seeing over 200% growth in their reach by localizing their content into different languages. But localizing news videos manually is painfully slow, very expensive, and extremely hard to scale. That is exactly why we came up with a technology for news and media channels to reach a larger audience by translating videos 10 times cheaper and faster than manual overdubbing services. This is a video from World is One News. Watch how the content is translated accurately and overdubbed seamlessly like never before. I am big breaking news coming in. Russian President Vlad Ashtrapati Vladimir Putin ne Ukraine mein senya abhiyan ki ghoshna ki. Pulhone rusi ne ki kuch surprise ala television rusi. Le président a appelé l'armée ukrainienne à déposer les armes et à déposer Using artificial intelligence, we can translate and overdub your videos in 40 plus languages and more than 200 AI voices automatically. It doesn't matter if your videos have background music or multiple speakers, our platform takes care of all of it. This makes the localization process extremely fast while reducing your video production cost by at least 70% over hiring voice actors or overdubbing services. You can get more views by translating your videos in all our supported languages. We understand that fast turnaround time is highly critical for news. That is why we provide package solutions to deliver translated videos in just a few hours, not days. Quality assured by expert translators. Reimagine the future of news video localization with Neural Space. Try now by sending us a one minute video or a YouTube.
Yeah, so that was a bit of the overview of what we have done on the video localization front. Um, again, it's a combination of multiple of the core services or downstream tasks commonly known in NLP and voice technology, which was the speech to text. We obviously also do a speaker um, separation or speaker identification when more than one speakers in the video, but then basically a machine translation task um, on the text and then we enter text to speech. And obviously there are also multiple voices available um, in, in multiple languages. Oh, sorry. I'm going to the next slide. Yeah, brilliant. So what really that that um, entire process breaks apart is that we have first the subtitle generation, or you can call it which is a speech to text offering. And really in the platform is that we have developed, which you can see here is actually a bit of a, um, is really a bit of a, the overview, the feature set that we have here. And here's simply someone walking you through so there is first the login page, obviously, but then you go under subtitle generation and upload a video. It can be a YouTube link or can be a file. And then you have here what you see now, uh, really everything side by side. So generate here first the, um, the subtitles automatically. Then afterwards, you can actually edit them. And then they, um, yeah, they have here. Um, yeah, here you can see it, I think. Yeah, so edit subtitle and then you have really one by one the different for the different segments of the entire video and then you can listen to them again and uh, can edit them if you want to what happens then afterwards is a um, subtitle translation i'm not showing the video here it's again we have a text to text translation it's again a nice editor format where you can then side by side compare the different um the different sentences or the different phrases that has been um, have been spoken in the video. Um, next, I would like to show you a bit what we have done on hyper-realistic voice generation. That's only the text-to-speech part. In the video localization, we also use that, but we have also seen quite quite a good interest of only using these text-to-speech voices themselves. Um, you can see here we have also cloned AI voices. So um, when there is, for example, a company that has some kind of a brand voice, when you see a certain person in their advertisement uh, when you would like to have, for example, that that person answers uh, your your call center with some kind of an automatic answering machine, uh, then we can clone that voice, obviously, with consent by, uh, by that person having that voice, uh, but technically uh, possible, and we have done that for, for previous uh, customers. So what we have done here um, is just Narendra Modi, basically. Um, it's not for sale what we have here, uh, but we just took it as an internal research project just really to evaluate our technology and just had the Narendra Modi reading out uh, basically a random a random story. And I can play a little bit of it. I don't know if you have any Hindi speaker um, with us, but they can hopefully understand the story and can hopefully also recognize Narendra Modi. एक आइलैंड पर दस लोगों की लाशें पाई जाती हैं। आखिर उन्हें किसने और कैसे मारा था? आइए इस कहानी की शुरुआत करते हैं। Yeah, so that's uh, probably just the first two lines. But what we have done here uh, took a bunch of Narendra Modi YouTube videos, about seven hours of data in total. और कुछ और बच्चा हम कौन yeah, uh, about seven hours of training data in total and then just replicated his voice. Uh, I can also show something more. Probably more of us are familiar with David Attenborough, who has absolutely great nature documentaries. And we again took some of his existing uh, videos that are either on YouTube or on Netflix. Here we only took about two hours of data, but then we made him reading out the neural space mission statement. And that's yeah, probably um, more understandable for most of us. Neural space was founded with a mission to democratize the world's access to cutting edge language technology. 90% of natural language processing solutions are exclusively available in European languages. We want to break down the language barriers encountered by people in Asia, the Middle East and Africa by enabling 6 billion people to access the internet in the language and mode of their choice. And yeah, that was just a bit of an example. I think most of us are familiar with the quite characteristic voice uh, and the way David Attenborough speaks. And I think we have done quite well in replicating that. 
Um, next, we have done here Barack Obama. Um, I uh, find that's kind of the one that has is the least realistic, although because Barack Obama maybe speaks in a very different way, that is hard to replicate by a machine. Uh, but we have even ta taken here 20 hours of data and was still was still quite difficult to replicate him how he speaks normally. Which dad, poor dad, is about Robert Kiyosaki and his two dads, his real father, poor dad, and the father of his best friend. Rich dad, and the ways in which both men shaped his thoughts about money and investing. Yeah, as you see, it's not as realistic as he speaks normally. Um, but we we again took took some data, replicates the voice, and just tried out uh, what is actually possible. Um, next, we have also worked on something called style transfer. Uh, maybe some of you are familiar with that when we want to have uh, a certain um, certain audio. Uh, being spoken with some kind of emotions can be very happy, can be very sad, and so on. So we have here first Obama just saying "twinkle, twinkle, little star." Twinkle, twinkle, little star. That was again Obama's um, Obama's generated voice. So we did, and then we had actually one of our engineers uh, singing "twinkle, twinkle, little star." Twinkle, twinkle, little star. And so we took. Oh, sorry, we took that kind of. Um, data here, here in the middle that was then more of, a, of singing and tried that Obama is now singing by combining these two audios and yeah the output is okay I would say. Twinkle twinkle little star. So yeah what you see is that we have taken the original audio put some a kind of additional audio to do a style transfer and then have one result. Uh, obviously it's still a work in progress very much uh, but yeah we, we try we try to get just an internal research project that we have. Um, secondly, we have done, uh, or yeah, thirdly, basically, is that we have worked on uh, people kind of speaking in a different language that they actually cannot speak, but having then a certain accent in that language. So I think what we have here, uh, again, I'm not sure if we have um, Indian participants, but we have Narendra Modi speaking in Spanish. Also, I think in real life, he does not speak any Spanish, but he has then kind of imitated what we have achieved is imitating an Hindi accent to Spanish, which sounds quite funny, actually. I algo sobre lo que quería hablar. Es sabido que los gatos se me son extrovertidos. Es la. So you see here that was actually Narendra Modi's voice, but speaking out in Spanish. Um, again, still improvement, but it, we just wanted to really like stretch the technology, what is able to uh, be achieved. Then to my last point of the of the presentation is code mix speech. So we do here speech to text, and we have seen that in multiple use cases. So call transcription is very common when call centers want to save their conversations as a script, what means as written text instead of audio, simply because of uh, data storage. Text is just a lot a lot smaller in in size uh, compared to an MP3 or a WAV form. Um, uh, data form, and then we've also seen some kind of voice bots like an IPR system, so an un automatic answering machine, and also for video auto localization. So, uh, what I show you here on the left is basically just our code mix STT, and we have taken a YouTube video where someone uh, speaks in Hindi English mix, and you will see it's kind of financial, uh, financial um, topics. He speaks about funds, equity funds, and uh, kind of different uh, times of the year, March to November. And these terms are always used in English, whereas everything else is used in Hindi. So it's normally quite difficult for models to get that, but we managed to get it actually with quite high accuracy. HTFC AMC, Azad Billa Sunlight AMC, Nippon Light Radio AMC, or UTI AMC. Sabi AMC stocks last one year may around 15 to 30% down hai. Like in mutual funds ka AUM to part sal may double ho chuka hai. Equity funds may net inflows bhi is sal increase huye hai. To business front pe achha karne ke bawa jood AMC stocks niche kyo gir rahe hai. Iska reason hai passive funds ki parthi popularity. March 20. 2021 से नवंबर 2022 के बीच पैसिव फंड्स का एयूएम डबल हो चुका है और टोटल म्यूचुअल फंड्स एयूएम में उनका शेयर 10% से 16% पे आ गया है या सो व्हाट यू सी हियर इज रियली अ मिक्स ऑफ इन हिंदी एंड इंग्लिश एंड सो दैट वी हैव हियर मंथ सो मार्च 2022 व्हिच यू ऑलवेज स्पोक 
or March 2021, which you always spoke in English, but then having lots of lots of India, uh, lots of Hindi um, words in between, and actually the model understood that quite accurately. So next, I uh, yeah, sorry, no, that's actually all from that presentation. Um, I have some other examples that I can show later if there's any interest, but yeah, feel free to ask any questions. I'm hope I'm hoping it was useful. Thank you very much, Felix. Thank you very much, Felix and Sebastian, for your presentations. Now, I guess in order to um, zoom out a little bit for our audience, um, you know, um, let's start with the basics, maybe. <laughs> so, uh, you know, um, the growth of language technologies is very rapid, but it's mostly for some small set of languages, like most notably it's English, but also German, French, maybe Russian. Uh, Chat GPT was recently released and it's also for a small subset of languages. So uh, how would you define um, an underrepresented language and what got you interested in, you know, what made you like interested in this field, uh, you personally, maybe Sebastian, if you'd like to start. Thanks. Um, sure, yeah, yeah. I think that's a good good question to contextualize things. Um, so, I mean, in the literature and like in the community, I think uh, the definitions of what constitutes an underrepresented or sometimes it's also referred to as a low reach language, I think vary. Um, but personally, I would define it as a language that is kind of not um, not typically or represented only in a small subset of papers um, and has a kind of more limited amount of data available. So there's kind of different ways in which you can categorize or look at the distribution of data. But if you look at both um, which languages are represented in Wikipedia, for instance, um, there's about like 100 languages which have reasonably large Wikipedia coverages. So one definition of unrepresented language could, for instance, be languages with um, like outside of these top 100 Wikipedia languages. Um, but there's different ways depending, like in speech, for instance, you could look at the available speech data sources. And so for the speech modality, there might end up with a slightly different definition of what is unrepresented. Um, yeah, and um, so personally, I uh, studied, yeah, uh, like as Chris mentioned, uh, I was studying computational linguistics and doing my PhD, I was kind of most interested and drawn to um, problems with uh, where there's limited data available. And so which is the case for these underrepresented languages uh, as we've discussed. Um, so I think for me, um, kind of both this area of doing kind of multilingual NLP and NLP for underrepresented languages is kind of interesting from a, just in terms of um, research questions, because um, I think arguably the setting where you have only limited data is one of the most challenging scenarios for like current models in NLP. Um, and at the same time, I think it's um, something that is very important from a societal perspective. Um, Felix and Chris and Daria, you already mentioned that we really need um, to support more languages in order to really of democratize and make this language technology more useful. So I think in terms of as an application area, I think it has is kind of coupled with a, a high potential for a positive impact. Um, and finally, I also I studied a bit of linguistics in undergrad as well. So I'm very interested just in kind of languages from a linguistic perspective too. And I think linguistically, I think it's just very exciting and interesting to be able to learn about the linguistic differences and the uh, different morphology and linguistic features of uh, other languages. And Felix, for you? Yeah, so would you differ? Uh, quite similar mm -hmm. to Sebastian. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting that actually two Germans are sitting here on the panel who are both not impacted by not having NLP for low resource languages. Uh, but I very much agree with Sebastian, though it's uh, technically challenging, which makes it both for us probably as a I think it's also for you attractive as a research problem as a technical problem that wants just we want to be solved or at least uh, made progress on uh, but then I also find the impact factor quite quite significant so um I think through the pandemic especially we were all kind of pushed towards more of a technology adoption and uh, there's one brilliant example uh, that I that I like to like to speak about where there was in India um, the possibility to book a vaccination through a WhatsApp chatbot. So you could really have a vaccination appointment booked in a, in a through a chatbot system. Obviously, that 
uh, chatbot was connected to a large database in the back end and so on. Uh, but it was just a second or an additional channel to call and have an appointment, or maybe there was a website. And um, again, in, in Europe, that's maybe not as strong, but especially in Asia, like WhatsApp is, is huge and businesses are like running on WhatsApp almost. So almost every every little restaurant in India, for example, has a WhatsApp, WhatsApp chatbot that you can just ask about opening times, menu items, and so on. So people were... Um, and they were really thinking, okay, I will use the chatbot to book my vaccination appointment. Uh, but then I think for the first two months, it was only available in Hindi and English. And I think yeah, most of us probably know that there are, I don't know, like something like 200 different languages or at least 20 major languages in India, which are not even dialects. They have a different alphabet. They're extremely different. And then many, many dialects, um, uh, sorry, yeah, many, many accents, many dialects within those uh, 20 languages. So it was for a large portion of the population just like impossible to book a vaccination appointment, which I find um, kind of yeah, like devastating almost, right? Um, why do the people who speak English and Hindi have have entitlement to get to get a protection for for their life when others when others can't? So there is that what motivates me a lot as well. I want to um, yeah really that we can use technology it goes from our smartphone to anything else in the world without being worried that we can't use it in our own language. That, that's like my, my kind of personal goal and hopefully the goal of the entire industry uh, that we move towards that. Thank you very much for your stories and your insights. So, okay, the next question is kind of follow up to this, to my previous one. So um, why we should even you know build language technologies for underrepresented languages for example a lot of us who speak english right and basically english maybe german and this set of languages it covers a lot of speakers right why should we do and you know kind of like make effort to kind of like even struggle to find data for these languages, like so many of them, right? We because I think we have like 7,000 languages in the world, but um, we mostly just speak English and so on, like this small set. So why should we even bother also building languages, language technology for these other languages? If you like, what is your point? How do you think? And like the question to both of you. Sebastian, do you want to start again? Um, sure. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, I think um, like yeah, what what you mentioned is I think kind of a good point or like a point raised kind of all like quite often in uh, favor of the self school, right? We already English is spoken by so many people, um, and like the major world languages, why not just stick with those and save us all like, a lot of a lot of trouble yeah, in in principle? And I think I mean Felix already gave a great example of the kind of um, like scenarios and societies where that really doesn't doesn't get us far, doesn't uh, really um, penalizes um, not just a small number, but a huge population of speakers. Um, yeah, for instance, yeah, like Felix mentioned in India, where there's languages that are spoken by tens or hundreds of millions of speakers that do not fall under these like major languages that are typically the focus of research. Um, and similarly, if we look at like the underrepresented languages, we are yeah, not really talking about small speaker populations, but I think it's around like 3 billion speakers who mainly have, like I said, the first language, a language that is, or like one of the languages they're speaking, a language that is not typically um, like the focus in NLP. Uh, so I think it's really about uh, kind of enabling uh, like equal access to technology and services and also not forcing people to yeah, have to learn like a, a language of a colonial, um, colonial language or a language that they might not be the preferred language of communication, but being able to communicate in the language that they feel most comfortable with and um, that most closely reflects their, their own identity. Um, and I think that's what we yeah, ultimately kind of need to aim for of, um, kind of enabling people to consume services in, in like the environment and the setting that they prefer. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, what I, I would add to that point is that I think culture is hugely either culture influences language or language influences culture. Um, but I think when we kind of move towards everyone speaking English and French, 
um, in this world, let's, especially, let's say, Asia, India, like as soon as a family has a bit of money, they normally send their kids to an English speaking school. Um, but then I think there's really like a cultural aspect that gets lost a little bit. And um, this means, okay, we would consume English content on video, right? What, okay, we would all watch, watch Netflix in English. Where do these movies come from? From the US and the UK, most likely. Um, so children start behaving in that certain way, want to have what they see in the movies, and really that total cultural aspect uh, gets more and more lost. Um, so I find there is a huge interest in just keeping a language alive because it has uh, it has cultural implications. And I find also that sometimes, um, yeah, people really enjoy uh, speaking their speaking their own language because they can express themselves in a way that they cannot do in English. And that's simply because a word does not exist in English or they have uh, they have a word, they have multiple words in their own language where English only has one word and then they can't really clearly, clearly explain or describe how they feel or, or what they would like to do. And I think that would be just, um, yeah, our, our world would lose some kind of attraction, I would say, if that's all get kind of um, monotonic towards English and, and French. And that's very much... Yeah, colonial, um, yeah, life, a colonial, I would say, attitude when we then all move towards that. So I think everyone who is not even directly Im um, impacted by technology that does not understand their local language should also care because it's just very, very interesting um, to keep keep the world alive with all the priorities that we have. Um, and yeah, I think I think it's just an interesting an interesting topic that has has lots of positive outcomes when there is very accurate uh, language technology for, for these lower resource languages. Thank you very much. And uh, from technical point of view, is there is it beneficial to be building models for um, underrepresented languages to make them maybe more robust? Uh, you know, because, yeah, so basically to teach the models uh, find patterns maybe and the more model the, the more languages a model knows and can operate with is better for the model is there anything something like this that's, that's like another beneficial part in it uh sebastian um yeah i mean so so i guess um we've seen kind of in at least in research and when training these like multilingual models um busy people have observed that um, kind of at smaller parameter sizes, or if you're talking about like a few um, hundred million parameters, um, the more languages you have there in your model, um, the kind of at some point uh, um, performance of your model across the different languages deteriorates actually, uh, just because the model now has to use a lot of, um, or is they only able to use few parameters for each language. Um, so the more languages you kind of add into the model, um, the few parameters it's going to have, yeah, have available per language. Um, so in this, to kind of contact that, basically you can scale up the models. If you train larger models, you actually um, uh, have less of that problem. So you can train large models that cover like 100 languages or so, and that achieve like um, still very or like reasonable performance across these different languages. Um, and um, but I think in terms of like positive effects, there's definitely I think particularly for the lesser resource languages um, some positive transfer effects. Um, mainly from like um, similar or related languages which have more data. So for instance, for many languages spoken in India, they would benefit from including uh, Hindi in the pre-trained data, for instance. Um, so I think kind of one very like promising research strategy these days is also, and that's what we've seen that in both for Indic languages as well as for African languages, for instance, uh, developing models focusing particularly on a certain language family or on a certain region and um, only training a model, for instance, for, for Indic languages. And in this case, I think the, kind of the effects um, are much more pronounced because now you have a model which mainly can benefit from actually sharing information across um, similar or linguistically similar languages without having um, yeah, kind of outliers or languages which are very dissimilar linguistically now. And it's a much easier kind of optimization problem in comparison. Yeah, so I would like to stress the, the transfer learning aspect that Sebastian mentioned. So uh, we, we have done that a lot at Neurospace uh, when working on low resource languages. In India, for example, we did Southern Indian languages as one. Um, so we actually kept South and North apart. 
Um, I have seen approaches where they did just like all of the Indian languages as one. Um, we separated south and uh, sorry, yeah, south and north. Um, yeah, which which gave us gave us good results, but um, different different approaches may may also have very good results for all Indian languages. Um, that is kind of the number one um, point that I would I would like to say, say that um, yeah, really that grouping of languages that are familiar uh, that are, are familiar to each other and come um from the same really from the same uh, history uh can be very combined to increase the data set and then there's huge learning um across uh, across languages yeah we have also seen um some strong monolingual approaches or even we have seen like really these large multilingual models where there were uh, a lot of languages being being added side by side um more than 100 for example on the speech front whisper is a great example and that was trained, I think, on something like 70 different languages. Also, the largest portion of the data that was still English, I think something like 60%. Um, but we have evaluated across different languages and actually get get decent results. Um, but yeah, there are, there are multiple aspects that can be, uh, multiple attempts that can be done. Uh, but yeah, definitely combining, combining languages helps in most of the cases. That's very interesting that more languages, you like, Binding languages actually has a very huge positive effect on, on these models. The next question I want to ask is, so we have Sebastian and Felix, you both come from um, academia and industry. So um, quite different experiences in terms of trying to build technologies for underrepresented languages. And in the introduction, you presented some of the key things that you're working on. Um, the question is, what is one most, like, most important, one major challenge that you're facing in your different fields of interest? So in, in your industry and academia, what's one major challenge you're facing in building language technologies for underrepresented languages? And also, what are some of the efforts that you're probably doing to battle that or you know of that's being done to battle that? Sorry, let's just start with um, Sebastian and Felix. Um, sure, I mean, I already touched on some of the like challenges, uh, like research challenges earlier, um, but maybe as someone who is kind of like doing research, but based in industry. And um, I mean, one challenge I also see kind of at like at uh, larger companies in, in general, or just companies which are maybe focusing on like a subset of languages and try to try to expand to more languages is kind of reconciling this like uh, the, the business metrics with kind of the like yeah the general goal that we, we would like to serve like users um across many languages and um yeah balancing with what kind of makes most sense from a business perspective and i think that, so there yeah for instance there's also a lot of like evangelizing or like education work going on that these are really kind of things uh, like topics that we need to focus on and then even though now for instance um, like Africa might not have the um, kind of the same internet footprint as um, as like India or as other like major regions um, if you actually look at the like development and growth in uh, like like in regions like Africa it really I think is uh, like makes a lot of sense to actually focus already on on support again investing on those languages and those communities. So I think in general, in this kind of research area, it needs to be not only in terms of research, but in general from an industry perspective, also kind of forward looking and um, yeah, building things that are uh, that can not only sort of use as now, but already like future applications that are being developed. Yeah, so one, basically the biggest, the biggest challenge we see in industry is that um, NLP models, both voice, voice and text, uh, have still generally like lower accuracy than than English models, right? And although we will like try to try to get that as high as possible, uh, we still very often like move in that part when we only measure accuracy and, and nothing else. We move in that part from you know, eighty to ninety percent accuracy. Um, so for lots of lots of tasks, um, for example, machine translation or let's say speech transcription or kind of, some kind of entity recognition, although. Um, what a business wants to do with an AI or machine learning based solution, they want to actually partly automate the task that at the moment a human is doing. So a human operates 
let's say for speech transcription generally with an accuracy or like a word error rate of something like I think it's exactly like 4.5 percent which is kind of the average human uh, word error rate on speech transcription so four to five percent now when we apply that for let's say I don't know Bengali um I don't know the, the most accurate Bengali speech to text model probably has I don't know about a rate of 10 percent or maybe maybe even a bit more um so for for business really first the question um why should I replace a human there's obviously also a scale factor right but why should I first of all replace a human when the human makes less mistakes and second it may even make less sense to replace a human because the human in that country where for example Bengali is spoken is generally not that expensive so the salaries are much much lower than anywhere in Europe and the US especially so it's it's really a question why should I use the machine when I don't make that much of economic um, profit on partly automating the task that the human does and I even get a lower accuracy what means maybe in some follow-on business processes I actually really suffer from these word error rates because I don't know sentiment is wrongly classified or something else right so there are these two challenges um, we have generally lower accuracy and generally human human labor or salaries in those countries are generally lower so it is a kind of a, a double-edged sword to really replace or partly automate human human tasks so we will need to um do something what what just business to say okay it doesn't really yet make sense let's wait for three more years to implement some NLP because then hopefully the models will all have 95 percent accuracy um so that's what we kind of face at the moment but obviously there are specializations on certain data sets where you can really push that accuracy to a very high level and obviously also have have an attractive pricing models for businesses so they um they don't um don't think it's a huge additional cost for them I see. And the next question kind of also follows up on what you just talked about. So um, in terms of business, you have many investors and venture capitalists looking at at, at accuracy and, and the uh, return on investment. And then when you come to research, you have a lot of works and things and, and highlights on the things done for high research languages, because then you can boast of very high results and metrics. Uh, the question is, and also, um, just a bit about where the question is coming from. When we look at the world, we, we are really um, captivated by big achievements. So there's ChatGPT, and I'm sure everyone here knows about ChatGPT and knows about Whisper. And you see these wonderful things, and we're all very happy using them. But there's like another side of the world, which is the low resource, underrepresented side that no one is talking about. And some of the work that you both are doing, um, like, it seems that they're celebrating all the things for the high risk society. So my question is how, like, as someone working on the underrepresented languages, trying to, to make technologies um, understand them and inc include them, how do you feel? And what's, your, what's your reaction and, and feeling around these things like chat GPT and whisper? Like, where, how do you see, um, it's not about you know, whether you feel happy or sad, but just, you know, how do you see your work kind of connecting with with some of the things that are coming out in the world and um yeah maybe we can start with felix to see from the Hopefully, industry Hopefully, side yeah. and then sebastian um no very good point but i think you need to look at where these accomplishments are celebrated of course like when you look at i don't know tech crunch or forbes magazine or what whatsoever or reddit uh, of course these english things are celebrated because that's kind of that's where they are hosted, right? They're all US companies or US platforms, Western European platforms, platforms of well-educated uh, tech professionals. Um, but then like today, I just gave an interview with a, with a local magazine here in Saudi Arabia. Um, and they, they really, really liked what we do because they said, wow, there has been nothing like that. We, uh, that you can even specialize on multiple dialects that are spoken in Saudi Arabia. There's nothing similar available, so it was like also really celebrated by them. Obviously, it's not the same audience because all the highly educated people mm -hmm. speak English, and all of them, um, like uh, in the US, especially, like yeah, everyone speaks English and, and, and reads these these magazines. Uh, but it's by a subgroup, also like extremely celebrated. And that's that's what what really gives me gives me fulfillment. And then when there is also some kind of yeah really like strong accomplishments that we achieve as a company 
for a certain part of, of the population of a country. Let's again uh, look at India, maybe like, let's even look at Sri Lanka. Um, for me, that, that's a huge achievement, right? That's more growth than any kind of tech crunch article or I don't know, um, for, like economics times or financial times or the which report about JTPT. Um, because for them people, like for them, it, make, it makes really like a huge difference. And if I was, or if we as a company were looking for these uh, kind of English speaking media attention, then like then we tackle the wrong problem right so for me it really doesn't matter i i want to have an impact for the people who are speaking the slow of languages and if it even gets into some kind of media um magazines or journals or something um it's double as good but it all boils down to yeah kind of the real impact that it can make on humans yeah yeah i think that's a good take and i mean in general i think um these kind of like very very visible like very hugely publicized um like projects i think are something that has i think uh, like mostly increased in in frequency like in recent years like with this whole attention and boom in ai right i mean recently if you look to like AI research you maybe have like deep blue from ibm like in the 90s and then like Watson in like Jeopardy, and like more recently some of these like larger scale projects or things from DeepMind, for instance. Um, but I think in many instances, like for a lot of these uh, like projects, even yeah, Deep Blue, Jeopardy, like uh, Watson, or like early uh, work from DeepMind, right? I think that's mostly kind of indicated okay, what was possible on like some uh, kind of benchmark that people came up with or some game or so. But in most cases, that didn't really have much. Like direct practical impact, right? You couldn't use uh, like the deep blue uh, model to serve like to solve any real world problem. And similarly, it took actually like a few, few years or like some time to also use the kind of algorithms and the uh, methods that were used in uh, like AlphaGo, for instance, to use them for like data center optimization and other applications. And similarly, with I mean with Chat GPT and I think recent technologies were maybe getting a bit closer to like bridging this gap. But I think also now. People, we're still figuring out okay, what to actually do with these, uh, like with these uh, models. Um, so I think as a researcher or someone like interested in this, uh, like in this general area, I think it kind of is useful to detach from these like very very public and uh, like just yeah like uh, projects where there's like a huge PR department behind. And I think look more. I mean, historically, research is kind of more incremental, right? About making progress and building on things and actually. Um, yeah, I think as Felix mentioned, I think it's much more rewarding to like uh, develop the first models, or the first data sets for a language that previously was not covered or not resented at all um, in in like the research or like product space. And I think there's something that we just, I think there's more awareness now for that these are really important developments in the community, which is something that I think was a bit underappreciated some years ago. So I think we've already made progress in on that front. Um, but I think just together as a community, we need to just like incentivize and and celebrate each other more for these advances and focus a bit less on these like very, very public um, cases. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> Unfortunately, there is no more time. So let's accept one question from the audience. So Sasha asked, how are the models being trained on the underrepresented languages? Um, anyone? <laughs> Maybe Sebastian, if you'd like to go first. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. So in, in practice, I guess it depends a bit on the modality, right? Maybe Felix can say a bit more on the speech side, for instance. Uh, but with regard to text, for instance, uh, you might be aware or familiar with um, monolingual models that have been developed, right? Models like BERT or T5 or GPT-3, right? All of these models are trained using kind of some variation of uh, like some form of like mass language modeling or language modeling where you predict the next token on like lots of um, unlabeled data from Wikipedia, from the web online. Um, and basically because these methods are more than these like transform architectures and the like objectives that these models are trained on, um, like scale really well with a lot of data. Um, so the same sort of methods has basically been applied kind of in a, the same fashion essentially uh, to learning on like large amounts of multilingual data as well. So now you do not only feature just uh, like one data or like one language into your model, 
but language um, or data in many different languages, around 100 languages for current text-based models and train jointly uh, using language modeling on this entire kind of combination of data. And yeah, and in practice this, even though it's kind of quite simple in, in terms of the like overall formulation, uh, I mean, obviously it's quite challenging from an engineering perspective, um, but that has really uh, like enabled models to learn like very useful multilingual representations. Yeah, quick addition, uh, how we have done some thing in neural space. Um, so again, as a research project, we took Whisper, which is obviously a well-known uh, speech-to-text model um, that came up by OpenAI a couple of months ago. And then we, uh, which has been trained, I think, yeah, in something like 70 different languages. The distribution of language in the data set is still very much leaning towards English. I think at least 60% of the data is in English. Um, but then we have fine-tuned it on a certain monolingual data set. Um, so there are also like great, um, great, uh, tutorials by Hugging Face how to do that quite easily. I think Whisper is already part of the Transformers library of Hugging Face. So as they have even then done that basically for you. So you have directly models available um, that are based on Whisper, but are then trained or fine-tuned on, on a monolingual data set. Okay. Thank you very much. Please, uh, do you both have time for one more question or do we wrap up now if you're busy? I can take one more. I don't know, Sebastian. Yeah, sure. Okay, so then the last question is, do you maybe have any recommendations for young researchers that are entering this field and want to work on underrepresented languages? Um, maybe Felix, if you want to start, recommendations for them. Yeah, totally. Um, so research is, is a very, very interesting, interesting area. Um, I think Sebastian agrees with me, but like being actually an academic, so getting into what starts with a PhD program, um, got out of my perspective ridiculously hard over the last five years, maybe, or maybe even over the last three years only. Um, so yeah, without a publication in a major journal, you basically have almost no chance to get into a PhD anymore or in a, at a major conference. Um, which I find, yeah, quite, uh, quite, quite tough actually. So you need to do research already on a master level, uh, and the master is by definition in in most countries a taught program and not a research program. You should do independent research that is publishable in in a conference where ninety percent of people who submit papers are holding a PhD, right? So that is kind of the level where you need to get to that you can get into a very good university uh, for PhD programs. That's that's very hard. Um, however, I find there's still like yeah thousands of open research problems um, that really really are, are meant to be meant to be solved, especially for low research languages. You can go in every in every downstream task. You can. Uh, look at efficiency of models. So when you deploy or when you in kind of um, yeah try to have a uh, production production ready system that can solve can serve multiple uh, multiple users and maybe even hundreds of users at the same time, uh, you want a very efficient model. So a large language model and a very large language model may not be the right choice. So there's also lots of research in, into that direction. Um, yeah, pick an, a topic that, that you really like, deeply care about. That's my, my strongest advice, because when you develop yourself to be an expert in that field, you will really work on that problem for many years. It's not just like a one-off um, problem, and you will really work on that most like for five years or potentially even longer. And you really need to deeply care about that. You keep your motivation very high to be able to produce that outstanding research uh, what you need to do to become an academic. Cool. Yeah. Uh, thanks. I mean, yeah, that was really great. Uh, great tips and pointers already, Felix. I think you covered covered a lot already. Um, maybe just to add to that, I think. Um, yeah. Well, Felix mentioned that. I think there's definitely the market for if you want to do a PhD in the area has definitely gotten a lot more competitive uh, compared to before. Um, but I think at the same time, I think there's also more. More structures and more uh, like groups and communities um, available these days. We can actually connect with others like before doing a PhD or like with different uh, backgrounds. Um, I think in the in the chat we actually 
like mentioned uh, a couple, but even um, in like other places, it might be like locally, you might maybe find some uh, like some meetup or even other groups in like Hagen Face Forum, and maybe even Neurospace might have some uh, some rooms to connect with uh, others. So I think finding uh, like um, particularly if you're starting out, uh, like finding like-minded um, people, or maybe people who've already done um, some research who can give you advice or mentorship or with whom you can like collaborate or exchange ideas or these communities where you can like yeah learn a bit about what are um, some like best practices or um, like interesting directions. I think that's a really kind of good way to um, like get get started. Yeah, and then I think beyond that, like reading maybe some some papers in the area that you're interested in, just to get an, a bit of an idea of what what people have done and what are interesting um, research threats, for instance. Um, but yeah, so I think that's mostly research. But I think also these days, uh, like Felix with Neurospace, I think there's interesting uh, like potential like in industry or for like startups as well. So I think if you're finding like you don't really want to just work on research, right? You want to have some practical impact for people. I think now is really a good time because a lot of models I think are quite like are at this kind of maturity stage now, where at least for some languages you can actually use them for different practical applications. So I think thinking maybe about okay, what is like a, a problem uh, like for your languages that is a real issue for people? Can you support them with like their legal queries or enable them to maybe get better healthcare access? Is there something where language technology could be helpful? And maybe also think, yeah, thinking about that from like a more applied perspective, I think can be really useful. Thank you. Okay. Very Thank you so much, Felix and Sebastian. Um, unfortunately, we cannot take any more questions, but feel free to reach out to Felix or Sebastian, so please, if you can put how they could reach out to you or to the Neurospace or, the, or find out more about the work that you're doing, please put on the chat. Um, thank you so much once again, Felix and Sebastian, for this panel discussion. It was very insightful learning about the efforts that you both are doing to include underrepresented and minority languages in NLP. Uh, I mean, I know about the great work you're doing already because I worked with some of you, but for the audience, we believe that this has inspired your interest in language technologies for underrepresented languages. And for those of you already working in the field, we hope you've learned something insightful, something useful from this panel discussion. Thank you all for attending. Um, yeah, okay, good. There's um, networking on the chat, so please put your details. Uh, Sebastian has a really amazing blog, and I don't know if he put it. Okay, yeah, he put it. It's a really wonderful blog for, if you're trying to understand NLP or trying to understand what's happening in NLP, this is, I highly recommend this blog. It's really wonderful. Um, thank you all so much for attending. Have a great rest of your day and um, stay tuned uh, for more events from Land Africa. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much. It was great. Thank you very much. Thanks for organizing. Thanks for organizing. Thanks, Aria. Thank you. Bye. Thank you and see you all. Thanks for attending, everyone.